the end, but I just had to say that at the beginning. And John and Mary Clavin have been very generous in creating the Clavin Conference for Family Education and Epilepsy. This went on for a number of years before I came back to Boston Children's, where I trained 30 years ago, but uh, the years have gone by, Bill. And I came back in 2014, and we've we sort of resurrected the conference. And this is our third one. And the first two were held at the Massachusetts Medical Society, which is a gorgeous building in Waltham, where the very famous prestigious New England Journal of Medicine is published. But of course, this year, we couldn't do it physically. But it's been so great to partner again with EFNE and to put this conference together. And when we had it in person, uh, Mary Clavin came and John Clavin came and they talked about their daughter. And they're so pleased that we are doing this this year in this virtual format and keeping it going. So this is going to be the first installment of what's turning into, I guess, a six part series that Bill has organized beautifully. And uh, this first talk is more or less an overview um, that has, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Renaissance because it has some references to history and art and literature and the kind of things I like to bring in to an overview topic, but we will have some specifics at the end for sure. And I did receive a bunch of questions that I could get through, but I also want to encourage people to say something at the end. So at the end, we'll work on unmuting people who want to add something. Now, epilepsy, it's important to know there's a new terminology. You know, they say going to medical school the first year is just learning a new lexicon. Well, epilepsy has developed a new lexicon. Although it's an ancient disease, it was known to the ancient Greeks. You probably recognize this still life here, this portrait of a vase was Vincent van Gogh. We'll get back to him. And this picture here by Michelangelo is hanging in the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the, in the Vatican. And it's the oldest picture we know of of, of uh, epilepsy, at least in, in classical art. You can see here that there's a father who's presenting his son having a seizure to the apostles of the deity personified here as Christ with the Hebrew prophets, Moses and Elijah to his side. And you see the eyes are wide open and the arms are extended and, and stiff. And this is the first reference that I'm aware of, at least in, in the classics of art of epilepsy being pictured. Now, the Clavin Conference had successful sessions, I mentioned, in 2017 and 19, and we already talked about the partnership. So this, this picture that I just described is known as the Transfiguration by Raphael, hanging in the Vatican Gallery in Rome. It turns out the ancient Greeks called epilepsy the falling sickness. It was considered kind of a sacred curse. Epilepsy has a patron saint. You might not have known that the patron saint of epilepsy is Saint Valentine. Now, the etymology, what are the words? Where do they come from? The word seizure comes from an old French term derived from the Latin, saisir. Not that I can pronounce French, but it means to take hold of. You know, something that take hold, takes hold of you. And it was first used in the literature as a military term by the Athenian historian Thucydides, when he was writing about the Peloponnesian Wars, and this is back when he said Sparta seized Athens. So it was taken as a military term of one army seizing another. Now, epilepsy, the word epilepsy comes from a Greek term, epilumbanian, which means repeated events, because one seizure doesn't make epilepsy. You have two or more, but the terminology has changed. So that's not necessarily completely true anymore. We'll get to that in a moment. I like to go over famous people with epilepsy. And you know, you can go way back in history, it's hard to document, but these great historical figures have well-documented epilepsy. You heard my hometown is Baltimore. Well, the bard of Baltimore, the great poet, Edgar Allan Poe, quote the raven nevermore, had epilepsy. So did the great English author, Charles Dickens. And the Russian novelist, Fyodor Dostoevsky, and the English author, Lewis Carroll, and the Dutch painter, Vincent van Gogh, and I showed you his painting before. You know, van Gogh is so famous for slicing his ear, but we actually know that depression and suicidality does run hand in hand with epilepsy, and his bipolar illness, or at least his depression, could be linked to epilepsy. There was a single U.S. president who had epilepsy. Did you know that Theodore Roosevelt had epilepsy. Now, not his nephew, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had poliomyelitis and was in a wheelchair and paralyzed in the legs. But Theodore Roosevelt had epilepsy. 
As far as more modern figures, the American singer-songwriter Neil Young has epilepsy. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, John Roberts, now whether you agree with his opinions or not, he is still the highest legal officer in the land. He's the Chief Justice of this U.S. Supreme Court. And when he came to Washington, I'll never forget the articles in the Washington Post saying he was on carbamazepine, Tegretol for epilepsy. Uh, the famous musician named Rogers Nelson, but everybody knows him as Prince, he had epilepsy. And talk about athletes. An African-American woman who was described as the fastest woman on earth, Florence Griffith Joyner, was a U.S. Olympic gold medalist in the sprint, 100 and 200 meter. And guess what? She died of pseudo, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients. We'll get back to that. Now, how long have we known about epilepsy? How long have we known it wasn't just a sacred disease, a curse from the devil, which is what the ancient Greeks thought? Who said this? But this disease seems to me to be no more divine than others, but it has its nature such as other diseases have and a cause whence it originates. And its nature and cause are divine only just as much as all others are. And it is curable no less than the others. Its origin is hereditary like that of other diseases. That's Hippocrates. We're talking about 400 BCE. Now, whether Hippocrates was a single individual or a school of individuals is, being, is always being debated. But the truth is, physicians then were fighting this concept that epilepsy was a curse and instead it was a disease like others. Now, there's a strong history of epilepsy in Boston. And I happen to be privileged here at, at Harvard Med School in Boston Children's having the Lennox chair. William Lennox was a major figure in the history of uh, epilepsy, especially American epilepsy. He founded the first seizure unit in the world right here at Boston Children's Hospital in the 1940s. And he wrote his two volume famous book, Epilepsy and Related Disorders with his daughter, Margaret Lennox. Did you know his daughter was diagnosed with epilepsy when she was three years old? He was then a, a physician to missionaries his whole life, all he really wanted to be was a missionary, but he didn't know Latin or Greek, so he didn't get into divinity school. So instead, he went to medical school. He went to Harvard Medical School, became a physician, and his dream was to become a physician to missionaries. But when he was in China with his wife, Mary, their daughter, Margaret, was diagnosed with epilepsy. So they came back to the U.S., and they were told to put her in a home for the irrecuperables. Well, guess what? She recovered from epilepsy, and she became a neurologist and a brilliant neuroscientist, and together with her father, they wrote this book, which was published in 1960, and he died just two years later of the stroke that he, that he sustained while giving a lecture on epilepsy at a meeting of the American Academy of Neurology. That meeting, that organization is having its meeting right now. I would usually say it's in Boston or wherever it's supposed to be. I think Chicago, but it's virtual. So I don't even know what city it's supposed to be at in 2021. We've lost all the travel. Uh -huh. So who might have written this? William Osler affirm that the physician who knew syphilis in all its manifestations knew all medicine. Today's scope for the person who would know all of epilepsy is even wider. In addition to the expanding preclinical sciences, including genetics, he or these days we would say he or she or they would encounter problems that belong in the fields of pediatrics, endocrinology, neurosurgery, neurology, psychiatry, laboratory diagnosis, and preventive medicine. They would delve also into medical history, sociology, legal medicine, philosophy, religion, social work, and medical economics. In addition, more than most doctors, they must learn the art as well as the science of the practice of medicine. This holistic view of epilepsy was exactly what was promulgated by William Lennox. So he had a very holistic view. And this is in his book that he wrote with his daughter that I just showed you on my bookshelf, Margaret. Now let's go to modern times. There's a new terminology. And epilepsy is considered a disorder way beyond the seizures themselves. So if I could pose some questions for today's presentation, it would be these four. What is the new lexicon or dictionary or terminology of epilepsy? How has the classification of seizures and epilepsy changed? What is the scope of epilepsy? And what are some of the basic treatments for epilepsy? And that's what we'd like to cover today. It is a big magnitude. Three and a half million people in the United States have active epilepsy, three million adults, about half a million children. And imagine this, 150,000 new cases are diagnosed every year in the United States. And approximately 50 million people in the world have epilepsy. As of when I last checked the CDC and the World Health Organization websites in early April, just a couple of weeks ago. 
So let's put this in perspective that we can deal with. You know, I remember that when it came to breast cancer, and I, on a personal level, my first wife had breast cancer. I was widowed at age 39 to breast cancer, to be honest with you. So I know something about chronic and serious disease. And I think they told us that one in eight women were, would be diagnosed with, uh, cancer, with breast cancer. It was unbelievable. One in 24 Americans will develop epilepsy. That's a lot of people. If you think about it, 24 people, not a lot of people. Out of a thousand children in any given school, six will have epilepsy. That's a, that's a fair number of kids. The risk of premature death in epilepsy is three times higher than in the general population. And children and older adults are the fastest growing segments of the population with new cases of epilepsy. Epilepsy is considered the fourth most common neurological disorder in the US after these migraine, stroke, and Alzheimer's disease. So the standard dictionary or lexicon of epilepsy is seizures can be either situational or epileptic. What do I mean by the situation? I mean a febrile seizure in a young child from ages three months to five years or the six birthdays kind of the last day or a hypoglycemic seizure from low blood sugar or an impact seizure from a head injury and an abrupt seizure at that point, as opposed to a later seizure, which would be post-traumatic epilepsy. But an epileptic seizure means there's an enduring predisposition to more seizures. And they've always been kind of divided into focal or generalized, or maybe focal with secondary generalization, meaning it starts in one focus and then spreads, or some of them just start all over, both sides of the brain at once. Of course, epilepsy is recurrent on provoked seizures. Now they can be triggered by like a fever or an illness or hypoglycemia or the menstrual period in a woman or maybe puberty in a teenager, but those are triggers, but they, if there still is an underlying predisposition to unprovoked seizures in epilepsy. However, now there's some new definitions. The old definition uh, pertains to unprovoked seizures occurring 24 hours apart. But the new one is a single seizure with evidence of a probability of more, basically more than 50-50, is now considered consistent with epilepsy. Why is that important? Because it was realized that people with driving licenses, especially commercial drivers, airplane pilots, all these careers that depend on whether you have epilepsy or not, if you have an adult with a single seizure and the MRI or the EEG shows that they are at a probability of at least over 50-50, they're gonna have more. I'm not gonna get into all the statistics, but that's basically what it means. They're now considered as having epilepsy. Interestingly, there is also a new definition for when epilepsy is resolved. Epilepsy is now considered resolved for patients with an age-dependent epilepsy syndrome now past the applicable age. In other words, benign Rolandic epilepsy. If you have a child with benign Rolandic epilepsy, we know that you outgrow that. <clears throat> between the ages of say 14 and 16, then it's resolved. Or any patient who's been seizure-free for 10 years and without medication for the last five is now considered resolved. There are always exceptions to the rules. You'll always hear about someone who went 30 years and then had a sudden seizure, but now it basically is considered resolved. If you're seizure-free for 10 years and you managed to be off medicine the last five of those 10 years. The terminology continues to change. There's an important think tank in Washington, D.C., known as the Institute of Medicine. And they published around 2012 this booklet called Epilepsy Across the Spectrum. And they made changes. For example, they said no longer use the term epileptic because of the stigma. Instead of saying anti-epileptic drugs, we say seizure medicines or anti-seizure medicines. Instead of saying epileptic seizures, we say epilepsy seizures. That's a little harder to roll off the tongue. But even more than that, the concepts of epilepsy have changed and that's led to a changing terminology. So for example, the etiology, which is a fancy medical term for the cause. We used to divide the etiologies into idiopathic, meaning we can't find a cause. Symptomatic, meaning there it's symptomatic of an underlying disorder. And cryptogenic means there has to be a hidden cause because there's something wrong besides just the seizures. These terms were considered somewhat confusing and not representing the latest research. So now the etiologies have been replaced by these six categories, structural, like a lesion in the, on the MRI, genetic, which is a huge growing area, infectious, like encephalitis, 
immune, the autoimmune conditions, which is a burgeoning area, metabolic, which is my own area of research, or can be uh, all kinds of things actually like a low, well, diseases of metabolism. And there's always an unknown. Now we have a lot of syndromes, usually arranged by age. I, I, I for example, mentioned benign romantic epilepsy. That would be an example of a syndrome where you look at the seizure type and the age and the characteristics of the patient developmentally, and you can come up with a syndrome. There's an important concept now that we call epileptic encephalopathy, which is meant to say that the epileptic activity itself may contribute to the underlying encephalopathy or underlying brain disorder. Beyond that, from just the underlying problem, and deficits may worsen over time. And the implication is that the seizures themselves or the seizure activity on the EEG itself could be detrimental and that maybe there's some reversibility if you can treat that. So there's a change, changing landscape of our concepts represented by the changing terms. Here's like the New Year's Eve special where some styles are in and some styles are out. So what's in? It's in to say a person with epilepsy, not to say an epileptic, to say epilepsy seizures or anti-seizure drugs instead of epileptic seizures or anti-epileptic drugs. Beyond that, we used to talk about simple partial, complex partial. It's all kind of confusing, I guess, but now we say focal with awareness or focal impaired awareness. And now we have convulsions more classified as whether they're focal or generalized and if they're how they start as motors, a tonic-clonic, which means stiffening and jerking or just tonic or just a convulsive, the clonic. Anyway, a couple other things. We would say infantile spasms. Now we call them epilepsy or epileptic spasms because they can occur past infancy, past one year of age. And again, these terms, idiopathic, symptomatic, and cryptogenic have been changed. They're not exactly equal to genetic, structural, metabolic, and unknown, but they've been changed. And even the term epileptic encephalopathy that I introduced, we now use the term developmental and epileptic encephalopathy because there are two components at least. One is the underlying developmental disorder and the second is the epilepsy. So the classification of epileptic seizures published by the ILAE, that stands for International League Against Epilepsy, that most of us grew up with was say around 2010, had epilepsy seizures divided into generalized and focal. And the generalized were six types, tonic-clonic, which is the grand mal seizure, stiffening and jerking, absence, which is the absence or the pedomal, myoclonic or the muscle jerk, tend to be very isolated muscle movements or briefly repetitive. Clonic is sustained muscle contractions with convulsing. Tonic is sustained stiffening, atonic loss of tone. And that's how seizures were classified for years, even before 2010, but it was kind of promoted again in 2010. But then things changed. So in 2017, seizures were classified as focal generalized and unknown in the way they start. And the epilepsy types were classified as focal generalized or both. But recognizing that there are these six categories of etiologies and their associated comorbidities like depression, which I mentioned, and some of them fit into syndromes. And then the seizures themselves were changed. So now, instead of the six types of generalized, generalized are called motor or non-motor. And the focal are characterized as aware or impaired awareness, and then characterizes whether they're motor or non-motor in onset. And it gets even more complicated. Notice now that we still have tonic, clonic, clonic, tonic, myoclonic, absence, and generalized, but we also have these in focal. Why is this even important? Because here's an EEG of a child with a staring spell. There's a pause and attention, and each of these boxes in green is one second of time. So there's a three hertz, that means one, two, three. That's three cycle per second, spike and wave, that is abrupt, it starts suddenly, it stops pretty abruptly, it lasts one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, maybe eight seconds, generalized three hertz spike in wave, that would be a generalized seizure. But then there's a five-year-old boy who came in who had myoclonic seizures of both arms, but one, the right one was a little more involved than the left one. And in the old days, we would have said myoclonic seizure, that's generalized, just go on medication. There's nothing more we can do. But it was recognized that because it involved the right arm more than the left arm, there was a focality to it. And he had an MRI and lo and behold, 
the MRI showed a lesion, which was a brain tumor of the left motor cortex. Now you're, you're thinking I'm crazy because I'm calling this left. But when you look at an MRI, it's like you're looking at the patient. And when I'm looking at this person, I hope you can see my mouse. This is their left eye. This is their right eye. So this is the left frontal lobe and this is the right frontal lobe. And their lesion here is right smack over the motor cortex on the left side of the brain that controls the right shoulder. And that's where the seizures started. So that's why it's important to know that myoclonic seizures, as well as epileptic spasms, can have focal onset because it changes our entire approach to how we treat them. And after this tumor was taken out, I was standing over the neurosurgeon's shoulder when it came out. It scooped out like a glistening uh uh, glistening marble or something. It's good at like you use an ice cream scooper. And that child's now been seizure free for six years and came off medication and had a kind of a tumor, unusual one. But that was the story of what was initially thought to be a generalized myoclonic epilepsy. Now, epilepsy is now considered really the epilepsies because it's a whole spectrum of disorders with many different types of seizures and different etiologies or causes and different syndromes and comorbidities and the excessive mortality. Now, what are the approaches to treatment? We should pay attention to triggers. Sleep deprivation, the big one. Medications is how we usually start treatment, but there are also dietary approaches and there's surgical approaches too. So what about lifestyle? Well, triggers are a real thing. It's hard to find in the book, but when you practice epilepsy long enough, you know it's real. And I've been practicing epilepsy for 30 years. Sleep deprivation, low blood sugar, menstrual period, they trigger seizures in people. Drugs, a lot of drugs trigger seizures, especially stimulants like cocaine. Drug withdrawal, that's a big one. Stress, I, I don't care what anybody tells me, I believe stress triggers seizures, even though it's hard to find in the books. In some cases, certain unusual stimuli, there are certain seizures that are stimulated by some patients hearing a certain song or having a certain thought or brushing their teeth. They're all interesting kinds of, and sometimes it's being touched. Uh, but you have to be careful because some of those could be startle syndromes and not epilepsy. Medications, diet, and surgery. So let's talk about diet real quick. The basic epilepsy diet is the ketogenic diet. Now, the ketogenic diet was discovered back in the 1920s at the Mayo Clinic, and then it was kind of brought to Johns Hopkins by Samuel Livingston in the 1940s and 50s, and it made a resurgence in the 1990s because a producer in Hollywood named Jim Abrahams, his son had epilepsy and they tried every medicine. They had a hemispherectomy. They removed half the child's brain in Los Angeles. And finally they came to Baltimore and had the ketogenic diet at Johns Hopkins and a seizure stopped. And they made a movie called first do no harm, which, you know, the Hippocratic oath back to Hippocrates, every person who graduates medical school has to take the Hippocratic oath first do no harm. Turns out the ketogenic diet stopped that boy's seizures. The ketogenic diet works by limiting carbs we all eat lots of carbs. I'm going to go home and have pasta, I guess, because my daughters are having pasta tonight. They're waiting for me, I guess. But they were actually probably not waiting for me. But the point is, we usually have lots of pasta. But anyway, they, they limit carbs because if you limit carbohydrates, your brain has to find an alternative fuel than glucose for energy. And it relies on something called ketone bodies, which come from lipids or fats. So it's a funny thing. It's a high fat, low carb diet. Carbs are restricted to 20 to 50 grams a day. That's not a lot. Um, there's a milder version called the modified Atkins where they don't really restrict fluids or calories. And there's something called the low glycemic index diet, which is even less restrictive. But the point of all of these diets, and they only should be done with dietary supervision by trained nutritionists and dietitians, is to limit the amount of carbs because that converts your metabolism into ketosis. You know, when you haven't drank something for a long time and your breath sort of smells like stale alcohol, that's because you have ketone bodies on your breath and you your urination goes down. That's what the diet does. There's nothing healthy about this diet, to be honest with you, but it changes your metabolism into ketosis and that can be protective against seizures. And then of course, there's surgical options. Surgery is divided into resections and ablations. Well, first I should say it's divided into curative and palliative. Curative means the intent of the surgery is to cure the epilepsy, if possible. And that can be a resection, which is removed tissue or an ablation where we use this laser thermal injury called the LIT, laser interstitial thermal therapy. Some people call it the Visualase because that was the first commercial one that came out. 
But this is a new thing, which is basically using a laser, which is a whole lot less invasive. It's invasive, but it's a lot less invasive than a big time craniotomy where you have to remove part of the skull and do a resection or removal of tissue. The palliative surgeries include corpus callosotomy to disconnect the two hemispheres so seizures don't spread so rapidly. And neuromodulatory devices where we use electrical stimulation, whether it's the vagus nerve stimulator that goes to the vagus nerve in the neck, the responsive nerve stimulator, where there are areas of the brain that can't be removed or there are two areas, say, instead of one, but there is a pacemaker kind of device called an RNS that kind of zaps the brain when the seizure starts. It's amazing. It's got this, got this loop where it perceives the seizure on EEG and zaps the brain to stop the seizure. And there's a newer device called the deep brain stimulator or it's a thalamic brain stimulator because that's where it's put called the DBS. My, for some reason, my, uh, oh, here we go. And finally, meds. I didn't talk about meds yet because it's so much information. I, I waited till I got through the lifestyles, the diets, and the surgeries. You know, this comes from an article authored by a friend of mine, Pavel Klein, called The Feast and Famine, Epilepsy Treatment and Treatment Gaps in the Early 21st Century, last June. It's kind of true. There's a, all these meds, but really we still have a lot of treatment gaps. But anyway, I think this curve is too much information. I don't want to go through every one of these meds, but the way I think about it is this. When it comes to the anti-seizure medicines, they're the basic five, then they're newer meds, then they're newest meds, and then they're the rescue meds. And to me, this is a more user-friendly way of thinking about it than the curve that shows a zillion different meds and names that nobody knows what they are. The basic ones are phenobarbital, because that was started in 1912. Before that, it was bromides, but we don't use them anymore. Phenytoin, commercially known as dilantin, carbamazepine, commercially known as tegretol, valproate, which is commercially known as Depakote or Depakine, and ethosuximide, commercially known as Zeron. These are the basic five. Everybody, every medical student has to know these five because they're the basics. And then over about two decades, at the end of the last century, a series of new meds came out that are in very common use. So I think it's worth mentioning them. Oxcarbazepine is the generic name. Brand name is Trileptal, Lamotrigine or Lamictal, Topiramate or Topamax, Levetiracetam or Keppra, Gabapentin or Neurontin, and Zanisamide or Zonogram. Lots of drugs were released, but these are the ones that are really in common use. And anti-seizure medications since 2000 that have had an impact on common use are these, generic name rufinamide, brand name Banzel, eslicarbazepine, Aptiom, Parampanil, Ficampa, Rivaracetam or Briviact, which is like a first cousin to Keppra, Cannabidiol, which is commercially FDA approved as Epidiolex, and the newest one is Sinobamate, not Sinabamate, sorry, Sinobamate or Excopri. So these, I'm presenting these because there are others, there are others. But these are the ones that have had a real impact on day-to-day -day prescribing in, on a large scale. All right, I'm going to try to um, talk a little bit about mortality just because I feel like I have to, because it's the kind of thing that if we don't talk about it, people learn about it from Dr. Google. You know what I mean. And that is worse, especially in families that have experienced it and didn't seem to know about it. So suit up stands for sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. Now, really, people have died from seizures since the age, the old, the ages. But we only kind of recently recognize, when I say recently, I'm talking about probably 15 years, maybe, that, that there's this entity that has given a name. It's given this acronym, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy or SUDEP, because we had to recognize it because we have to have some way to deal with it. Now, in general, it's associated with poorly controlled seizures of the grand mal type, generalized tonic-clonic type, nighttime seizures especially, childhood onset especially, and especially young adult, but also a lot of the genetic epilepsies like Dravet syndrome, scn one a or scn 8 a they have a particular predisposition for pseudo. But here are the basic facts that every neurologist needs to know. Epilepsy overall has two to three times increased mortality. Pseudo usually occurs after a massive generalized tonic-clonic seizure although most cases are unwitnessed. The person is usually found deceased prone in their bed, meaning lying on their stomach. 
but it's rare. It's rare. One in 10,000 of people newly diagnosed. Remember, I said 150,000 Americans diagnosed every year with epilepsy. One in 10,000 will experience pseudo. But if you have long standing epilepsy, it's more like one in 1,000. And if you have medically refractory epilepsy, which means seizures are not controlled, and I mean grand mal seizures, I don't mean focal or absence or myoclonic. But if it's generalized tonic-clonic grand mal seizures that are medically refractory, then it's more like two in 10 out of 1,000. Still rare, but not as rare. But people learn about these things. For example, here's a young, attractive actor. I never heard of him. But the New York Times ran this article July 10, 2019. All of a sudden, we got all these calls. What is this thing called suit up? Well, the Disney Channel star, the Disney Channel star's family released a statement confirming his medical condition, which was epilepsy, which led to a fatal seizure over the weekend. In the U.S., about 2,600 people a year die from a disorder known as sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. So this is how the public finds out about these things, and there got to be better ways to find out about it. Anyway, of the causes of death in epilepsy, SUDEP is the most common. I already talked about this, and I really talked about this. So what's modifiable to take the treatment? You know, people are sometimes resist the treatment, but one compelling argument to take treatment is you got to do that because you got to decrease your risk of pseudo. Avoiding alcohol turns out to be important. Avoiding sleep deprivation. Overnight assistance. You know, we used to write letters for the college kids saying they had to have their own room in the dorm because of the stigma of epilepsy. Now we write a note saying they have to have a roommate because overnight assistance turns out to be helpful and treating sleep apnea and monitoring devices. We're gonna have a whole session on devices by Dr. Subayama, but these new seizure watches and the Embrace watch, they seem to be helpful. There's even a seizure pillow. No one really knows how well it does, but you know, with the back to sleep campaign with babies to reduce crib death, we would have babies sleep on their back and now all the babies sleep on their back and their heads get flat, but, pseudo, but crib death went down. Well, we think it could be helpful if a person with epilepsy who has a seizure has a pillow that allows for rebreathing because it has a mesh that allows you to rebreathe, a little respiratory effort will go a long way. That's the idea of using a lattice pillow. I'm gonna end by quoting some literature. Remember I, remember I said we're gonna have some Renaissance type stuff. A lot of people read a lot of junk on the internet or social media, to be honest. Sorry to call it junk, but it is. But sometimes the person asks me for reading advice. In fact, I just had a family last week. The mom may be on this call. I'm going to look for her in a moment because she said she was going to try to join. She's wonderful. She asked, what do I read? I tell you, read great literature, read books. Don't read this junk. How do you, what do you define great literature? Well, Pearl S. Buck, the Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winner, wrote this book in 1950. Now, you know her from her book, The Round Earth, but she wrote this book, The Child Who Never Grew, about her own daughter her own daughter who had a terrible neurological illness and the disease wasn't even discovered when she was a little girl. They didn't discover until after Pearl Buck died that her, her daughter had phenylketonuria, which is the first of the diseases that was used in newborn screening back in the 1960s. But anyway, here is what she wrote of the parent's experience or the person's experience of dealing with a disease like this. She wrote that it required endurance of inescapable sorrow, something which has to be learned alone. Endurance is only the beginning. There has to be acceptance and the knowledge that sorrow fully accepted brings its own gifts. And sorrow, which it can be transmuted into wisdom, which if it does not bring joy, can yet bring happiness. She wrote, my own resolve shaped into the determination to make meaning out of the meaningless. Her life, meaning her daughter's life, must count. I could not rejoice in the knowledge that others had the same burden that I had, but it made me realize that others had learned how to live with it, and so could I. Finally, I re recommend that you read Kurt Eichenwald's book. He came to the Epilepsy Foundation event a couple of years, and I got my own signed copy, but talk about learning about epilepsy. This, this young man was a brilliant student. He went to Swarthmore, but he had such bad seizures at Swarthmore, they, they expelled him. He had to go through the courts to get back in, became a prize-winning author for the New York Times. You can't get any better than that. And if you read his memoir, it's a tough read, I'm going to warn you, but you read his memoir, you'll learn a whole lot about epilepsy. I've had physicians who are very experienced in neurology tell me they read this book and learned more about epilepsy than they ever knew. I want to give special acknowledgments here to the Claven Conference Planning Committee, above all to Bill Murphy, who's the chair, 
And on the Boston Children's Hospital side, we have Cheryl Cahill, nurse extraordinaire. Colleen Gagnon, our nurse supervisor of outpatient services, wearing too many hats for a single person. Chris Ryan and Megan Sobey are our social workers who are completely dedicated to epilepsy. I can't say enough about them. We wouldn't survive without them. And a young faculty member, Melissa Subayama, MD, who's going to be giving the talk I mentioned on devices and, and rescue. And that's going to be, I think, really wonderful. On the Epilepsy Foundation of New England side, I want to recognize Jennifer Cordelio, Hannah Clark, Steve Chrysos, Sarah Speck, and of course, Susan Lynn, and also Ed Underwood has been so helpful in terms of being a partner. Bill mentioned this at the beginning. We have created some YouTube teaching videos. They're less than 10 minutes. There's some great ones on giving rescue meds, but the legal office won't let us put them on YouTube because it's giving meds. I think it's crazy. But if you get a chance, and Bill can send out the links. There's one on a pre-surgical evaluation, one on getting admitted for EEG monitoring, one on EEG for the child to watch, one on EEG for the families, the parents to watch, that I think you'll find really entertaining and informative. And so that is my presentation on epilepsy as an overview for the Clavin Conference, a new lexicon for an ancient disease. I think I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and then we can have some conversation. Dr. Pro, I can't thank you enough. Um, you know, I've been involved with the foundation many years and every time I attend one of these sessions, I learn something new. Um, um, we had a number of great questions come in if you have a few minutes to uh, uh, address some of these questions and actually one was just emailed to me and I'll start with that and then I'll turn it over to Hannah uh, to go over some of the other questions but you had mentioned about the etiology and the change um, and you mentioned things like structural genetic infectious etc and the question that came to me are, are there typically specific seizure types associated with say structural or different seizure type associated with infectious? You can make some general guidelines because if you have a structural abnormality, you're gonna expect it to be focal onset as opposed to generalized where you might expect more of a genetic epilepsy. But there are all kinds of combinations. There are plenty of genetic epilepsies like Gervais syndrome where you have both focal and generalized. Um, in metabolic diseases, which is my own research, we expect myoclonic, uh, but they can have all sorts too. So these are just guidelines, but you can make some uh, correlations there. Right. Well, you know, that, that's sort of another thing we know about epilepsy is one size doesn't fit all when we're talking about any one specific thing. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Hannah, I think, who has some other questions that had been submitted. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bill. Um, I'll start with one that I can imagine a lot of people would find helpful. Um, can you explain the different classifications of seizures, um, maybe generally for someone who's new to a diagnosis? Yeah, and I want to just mention, I can't, I think I'm just seeing panelists here, not participants. So there may be some participants who actually wanted to say something. So if you just, if they chat, send you a chat, maybe you can open it up to them. Because um, some of our nursing staff and social work staff, and maybe some parents, I thought were going to try to say something. And I don't want to take up their time. Um, but the question was about the classification. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's very similar to that prior question of if you have a structural lesion, you have focal. So the classification is, are you, you have a situational seizure, just a femoral seizure or an epileptic seizure. And then if you have an epileptic seizure, is it focal or generalized in the beginning? And that's important because the we have different medications. There's some crossover, but certain medications are more geared toward focal. Certain ones are more geared toward generalized. So we try to say, if someone has a generalized seizure, well, then how does it start? Is it a motor or non-motor? Non-motor, say, would be absence. Then it's typical absence, which is a three hertz spike and wave, or atypical absence, which is a slower spike and wave. Then the motor onset would be, could be tonic, myoclonic, atonic, clonic, tonic-clonic all these different things. And then focal, we go through the same thing. But with focal, we used to say simple partial or complex partial. Simple partial meaning there was preserved consciousness and complex partial meaning there was altered consciousness. But now we say focal with aware, focal aware, meaning awareness is preserved or focal impaired awareness, which means alteration of consciousness. Well, I could go on and on, but I think that covers it for now. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and then another question was, what promising medications are forthcoming? If you wanna answer wow. that. 
That is such a great, great and loaded question because the research is amazing. So there are new seizure meds coming down the belt, like fenfluramine was the latest one to be released for Gervais syndrome. You know, that used to be fenfen, a diet pill back in the 50s. And then it was thought it was realized it was causing fibrosis of the heart. But it was discovered to be helpful for children with some of the worst epilepsies, Gervais syndrome and lennox gastaut syndrome. And now it's been approved as long as you do some monitoring. It seems to be safe. So fenfluramine is newly coming out. It's just come out. And there are other ones in progress. But most of the exciting ones in progress are what we call targeted therapy, which means we're looking at these genes and, and devising medications for those genes, whether it's enzyme replacement therapy, which has come out for some disorders, the metabolic stuff I do research in, gene therapy, replacing genes with better copies using viral vectors, or ASO therapy. The newest hot thing, <clears throat> your Colleen's getting admitted here, that's good. The newest hot thing is ASO. ASO means antisense oligonucleotide. So what that means is we're looking at the gene defect and developing, when I say we, these are people in the laboratory, developing nucleic acids, the backbone of DNA. Remember adenine, guanine, cytosine, thymidine? <clears throat> They're creating strings of nucleotides in short bunches. So oligonucleotides that are called antisense oligonucleotides, which means they're geared toward that piece of DNA that needs to be skipped over or needs to be changed to get around the defect. And there's so much exciting research right now, including for Dravet syndrome right now, to looking at antisense oligonucleotide therapy. So most of the medical therapies in progress have to do with getting at specific targeted uh, genes. In terms of other therapies, there's something really exciting on coming out called focused ultrasound. You know how a pregnant woman gets an ultrasound of her uterus and look at the baby. Well, it turns out the ultrasound is being used on the head to shrink tumors in some cases, and it's also turning out to be effective as an experimental treatment for epilepsy. I, and again, I think Colleen joins, she may want to say something. There. Hi, oh, there I'm she so is. sorry. <laughs> um, caught up in uh, something. Um, uh, I think that um, you hit on so many of the therapies. I, I don't know if there's, you know, major questions. I'm happy to answer them from just a, you know, an everyday perspective, you know, sort of like the ins and outs of, you know, how to secure these and how to, you know, go about, you know, uh, looking into or advocating, you know, any of those issues, you know, and, you know, we're happy to answer that from, from that perspective. So. Thank you, Colleen. And yes, um, as Bill mentioned, you know, we have some pre-submitted questions, but any, if anyone here has any specific questions, feel free to um, put them in the chat or to just speak up. Um, we'd be happy to hear them, but I can continue reading off the ones that we have um, okay. pre-submitted for now. What do you so have? The next question is, are CBD-based products being considered and studied? Well, the CBD-based product that was formally studied is now marketed by the FDA as Epidiolex. And I am not actually aware of other CBD products being studied by any pharmaceutical company. If they are, I just don't know about it. I haven't seen anything published on that. But um, people have certainly tried different CBD artisanal products, we call them, with different amounts of THC in it. You know, the THC is the tetrahydrocannabis. It gives you the high. And the CBD, the cannabidiol, actually doesn't give you the high, but um, it has efficacy against seizures. And it was studied specifically in Gervais syndrome and Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. And so it's indicated for seizures associated with those syndromes. Now, those syndromes have so many different types of seizures. Remember I said before that you can have a genetic disorder that has both generalized and focal. And both Gervais and Lennox-Gastaut are sort of considered genetic syndromes. Certainly the Gervais, Lennox-Gastaut is more of a heterogeneous group with many, many causes. But there've been over 50 genes associated with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome. So you would count it as a genetic epilepsy. And these patients have generalized and focal seizures. And these medications have been shown effective in those syndromes. So the CBD or the epidiotics can be indicated for all sorts of epilepsies looking at it that way. There's a, there's a question that's been um, put into the chat. Should I read that or Hannah? You yeah, can... yeah, yeah you absolutely. got access to that. So the question is, my son was diagnosed with HNRNPU. His deep, well, okay, so that's interesting because that question 
emanates right from the ASO discussion that I had. And um, there are so many epilepsy genes. The HNRMPU is, is one of them. Uh, it used to be that the epilepsy gene panels had 50 some genes and then 100 some genes. And now they have like 500 some genes. So it just keeps going and going. Uh, whether that defect is amenable to ASO therapy, I'm not able to answer that. I'll be honest with you. It would take a geneticist who looks at that area of the DNA. Uh, I'm looking at it here. I'm trying to figure it out real quick, but I, it's not enough information for me to say. But uh, are the epilepsy genetic? We have a whole epilepsy genetics clinic. And that's who you would ask that question because what they would do is look at that particular nucleotide change that you described, which is that position 520 where the cytosine is going to a thymidine. And, and they'd look at that and they'd say, it's possible, but um, then you have to find a lab who could do it. And it is kind of a mess because there's hundreds of genes and, every, and a lot of people have different defects. And so we're just trying to figure out how to grapple with this right now. I can't give you a better answer than that. But if there is an approach to that disorder of that type, that would be ASO therapy. It wouldn't be enzyme replacement. It wouldn't be gene therapy uh, that I know of. That gene, uh, HNRNPU, I'm trying to think what I know about that gene. Um, you know what? That's one of the EIEE genes. You know what that stands for? Early infantile epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, there's like over 60 different forms of that, that disorder alone. It's one of those. Then another question is my 13 year old son was just diagnosed with epilepsy, generalized tonic-clonic. He has no risk factors, no family history, no trauma, prenatal, perinatal, no concussions or questionable incidences. And they're all just saying his cause is genetic. Again, there's no family history. Is it common practice? Yeah, it is. It is common practice because the genetics of epilepsy are really complicated and they're thought to in general be multi factorial or multigenic, which means multiple different genes are involved. And they're something called um, um, epigenetic factors, which means there are factors of the DNA that aren't the genes themselves, but aspects of the DNA that modify the genes. And epigenetics is turning out to be even more important than genetics. It's the control of the genes. Obviously, genetics is really complicated. How else do we become human? It involves so many pathways and metabolic things. So if your neurologist is saying it looks genetic, that's because it's not necessarily that it runs in a family. It could be a de novo. A lot of these are brand new, out of the blue, spontaneous mutations, a de novo mutation. It might not even be something that can be identified. And it often takes complicated tests from epilepsy gene panels to something called whole exome sequencing. And beyond that, there's gonna be something coming up called whole genome sequencing to identify these things. But this assumption that it's genetics is more based on the phenotype, which is the clinical characteristics, than necessarily the genotype that may not be identifiable, which is the type of gene disorder. That's a hard one. Right. There was a follow-up comment to that, Dr. Pearl. Uh, the same person said, so the genetics is a genotype, not a phenotype. The genetic defect is called the genotype. Okay. But that statement could be made based on the phenotype, even though if, even if they didn't find a genotype. Okay. And I would just say in the, in the old days, we would just call it idiopathic, meaning we don't know why, but it's, we don't use that term as much as we used to <laughs> because nowadays we're just finding more and more uh, of the genotypes that are affiliated with it. But, um, you know, I think prior to that, it was just that you would have an idiopathic generalized epilepsy. And, you know, um, that was, you know, that was really the difference that it, it just, we didn't give it a cause. Uh, but now we know that more than likely there is a genetic cause. We just haven't discovered it yet, as Dr. Pearl said. So. Exactly. Yeah, we still have some other questions that had been submitted, but for the folks online, uh, I, I guess I'll do last call. If, if you have a pressing question you know, to ask right now, feel free to use the chat. And um, I guess since I'm still unmuted, I'll ask the next question and save Hannah from having to unmute again. Um, it's a pretty direct question. What are the safest meds for pregnancy? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> there's been a lot of studies of this. There's a whole MoNeed study. Uh, which is a fancy acronym for neurodevelopmental defects associated with uh, 
women with epilepsy and babies. <clears throat> Let me say this, um, Capra and Lamictal are considered, let's put it this way, surveys and studies have been done showing they're the most commonly used medicines in pregnancy in the pregnant women with epilepsy. Uh, Kepra and Lamictal. Are they the safest? Uh, we think so. It doesn't mean they're 100% safe, but you can't say anything's 100% safe, but they seem to be safe. Um, most women with epilepsy have successful pregnancies. Uh, the majority of women with epilepsy, it's said to be 70%, don't really have a change in their seizure frequency. And of the remainder, about half have less seizures in pregnancy and about half have more. The presence of a generalized tonic or grand mal seizure in pregnancy is a threat to the well-being of the mother and the fetus. And so we do have to treat seizures in pregnancy. And the key is, is to monitor the levels because the blood levels of the meds tend to change. And even though I said Lamictal is one of the most commonly used meds in pregnancy, the levels tend to go down because of increased metabolism by the liver and the kidneys in pregnancy. So the, the doctors will check your Lamictal levels at the beginning of each trimester and then more regularly in the third trimester. So um, it's just important to really monitor the blood levels of the meds during pregnancy. And then after the pregnancy is finished, it, it's all gonna shift back because pregnancy is such a, metabolically, it's such a changing time in a woman's body. Um, but that's the answer to, that's a quick answer to managing anti-seizure medications during pregnancy. Okay. Um uh, I'm just noticing the time. It's 7.29, and I like to respect everyone's time frame, and I know some folks still having a dinner. And, of course, at, at the end, coming up to the finish line, we're getting a, a, a number of questions. So I, if we have a minute to take these last two, and then I, I think we'll have to end the session, and we'll hopefully be able to answer the other questions offline via email and get a response to everyone. But um, the question is, I am on Vimpat Integritol. How safe or unsafe are those meds with pregnancy? Um, and the same person states that I have a seizure every night. You know, those, those meds are actually okay for pregnancy. Um, a lot of seizure meds, the levels go down in pregnancy, but Tegretol actually, for some reason, doesn't really go down as much as a lot of the other ones. So that one's okay. Vimpat, there's less data. It's a little newer, although it's not brand new, but it seems to be okay. Now, you, when you say you have a seizure every night, I'm not sure what that, if it's a grand mal seizure, that needs, that's, that's a problem. Then you need better control. If it's not a grand mal convulsion, if it's more of a focal seizure, it may be okay. But those meds are considered okay in pregnancy. Is that, that's, that's for that question. I see another one. Do you want me to read the next one? Yeah, and then uh, I think we'll have to take that as the last question and, and close out this session until next time. So you this, was, take it. this one says, my 14-year-old daughter was just diagnosed with epilepsy after a single seizure and testing revealed a brain malformation. Medication Kepper has been suggested as an option. We're not sure to make the best decision. You know, that is a situation where you would, in general, start a seizure medicine. Kepper would be one of the most common ones to try. It's a very safe medicine. It doesn't affect the other body organs like the liver and the kidneys and the heart and the blood. Kepra can be associated with irritability. I mean, that's just a common problem with Kepra. It may be 10 to at most 20%, but still. And if that's the case, there are other ones to try that I, we've mentioned here today, like Lamictal or Trileptal. But Kepra is a good bet because you don't have to get a lot of blood work. You don't have to get any blood work. And it's a, it's a good, safe one. The other issue with this child, though, is there's a brain malformation. So we get into the issue, well, when would surgery be indicated? And we say that surgery is indicated for medically refractory epilepsy, which means the meds don't work, which when I was in training 30 years ago, it meant five meds didn't work. Now it's down to two because there's plenty of data showing that if the first or second medicine doesn't help, it's pretty unlikely more medicines will control the epilepsy. So if everything is controlled and stable with just Kepra or one other med, then that's, that's good. But if things can't be controlled or tolerated with say trials of two different meds, then you look at other options like surgery. These are very overview comments. Don't take this as you know, direct medical advice for your child. Right. 
Well, um, g given the time, I only have time to say a huge thank you to Dr. Pearl um, and, and thank you for, to Colleen for weighing in also. Uh, and in closing, I just want to remind folks, we will be sending out an evaluation via email and that same email will provide the links uh, to the new series, uh, the YouTube videos that Dr. Pearl mentioned and be on the lookout for future announcements for our next program, future announcement and registration for our next uh, session. Uh, Dr. S uh, Subiyama will be uh, joining us for that and talking more about the advances in surgery, devices, et cetera. Uh, so again, everyone, thank you for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.